invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 1 uh, in just a moment. Exodus uh, chapter 3 in verse 1. We've been looking in chapters 1 and 2 about how God is moving. And I don't know if you notice, but from time to time I'll say, okay, look at this next scene uh, or look at this setting. And the reason I'm doing that is uh, very intentional is because I want you to see what's I guess, really obvious, and that is that uh, we're reading a story. So the reason why I don't say point one, point two, point three, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we're going through Hebrews, there were kind of points that the author's trying to make. Stories don't generally have points, they have scenes, that's the structure. It wouldn't matter if we did that necessarily, but we're trying to say that we're trying to represent not just what God says, but do it in a way that he did it, which is the scenes of the story. And so we learn something. There's something instructive about the structure in which God gave us these stories. About 60% of the Bible is given through story. Isn't that interesting? And so these stories have meaning, and so we'll read them like their stories and then try to find the meaning inside of them. And so this story is interesting in that it has a very simple setting, and it really only has one scene. It's a conversation between Moses and between God. And so let's look at the setting for the story. It's found in verse 1, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, every setting answers some basic kind of fundamental questions, like the who, what, when, where, and why. So let's think about that for a minute. The who, well, obviously this is Moses. Remember Moses, his mother's name was Jochebed. She took him when he was born because the king was trying to kill the infants of the day. And she hid him away in the reeds in the Nile, winds up being raised in Pharaoh's house. And what we saw in chapter 2 is that God is on the move. Even though we don't sense it and didn't see it as we sang just a minute ago, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, you're moving. And so all the stories of chapter 2 are trying to show us that God is on the move. He was staging for something. And this is who Moses is. He's the one who is the centerpiece of this story at this point, who God is about to move in a profound way. So that's the who, but the what. What is Moses doing? Well, look what it says. He was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He was working for his father-in-law as a shepherd. Now, where I grew up, there was a great kind of, uh, you know, almost American mystique about a rancher, a cowboy, right? This is, uh, this is the way we feel about it in America, but this is not the culture then. In Egyptian culture specifically, we know this from Joseph's story in, in Genesis chapter 24, he's afraid to bring his family into Egypt because they were revolting to them because they were shepherds. They hated shepherds. They were despised. And so they're trying to paint a picture in this story of someone who was raised up in the king's palace, prominence and privilege and luxury, and now he's keeping sheep literally on the backside of the desert. The wind is uh, 40 years. So we know that from Acts chapter 7, although it's not time stamped here in Exodus 3, it is in 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 Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7 that he left Pharaoh's house when he was 40 and he kept sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. So he's 80 years old. That's um, how old he is. And what about the where? Where is he? Well, it says he is in the west side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So this is what we would know as Mount Sinai. Perhaps Horeb was the region. Perhaps Sinai was the specific location. But the point is, this is significant. This is where he's going to receive the Ten Commandments. This is going to be the principal place in which heaven meets earth. Mount Sinai is where God comes down and meets with Moses and is going to give him the Ten Commandments. So it's a very, very special ground, although he doesn't know it yet. So all this setting is showing us a picture of someone who has moved from prosperity to obscurity. And for all we know, Moses thinks that's it. It's his life. He... He has no idea about what's coming next. All he knows is what he'll never be again. He'll never be in Egypt again. He'll never have the luxury of Pharaoh's palace. He has absolutely inequivocally turned the back on the faith of his adoptive mother, if you will, and he's following the faith of his true mother, Jochebed. He is all in for God, if you will. He left Pharaoh's house. So that's the setting of the story. What we don't have in verse one is the really why. Why does God have him here? And that's answered in this scene. Look at it, it ends in verse 2. Here's what happens next. 
The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him to the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Now let's stop here in this first part of this this scene. Moses sees a burning bush. Now, this burning bush, out of this burning bush was the angel of the Lord. So let's stop here and think about this. Who is this angel of the Lord? Well, a couple of very important things that you need to know about this angel of the Lord. The first is this, most important thing. This angel of the Lord is not an angel like we understand him. In other words, if God were to call all the angels in heaven together to have a roll call, he wouldn't say there's Gabriel, there's Michael, and there's angel of the Lord. He was not one of them. You say, why would you say it like that? Well, because the principal function of angels is to be messengers. They did other things, but that was the principal thing. In fact, in Greek, uh, angelos, the word for angel, just means messenger. They, They were messengers. They were taking God's message to the people. They spoke for God. But in Exodus chapter three, this angel does not speak for God. The angel speaks as God. The point is, is that he sees this angel as God. In fact, skip down to verse four. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the bush. So the idea is that this angel Lord is speaking as if the angel is as God. So who is this angel? Well, because of this, it's led people to believe that this angel could be the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, in a pre-incarnate, pre-Bethlehem, before Bethlehem, he comes down to put himself in the form of the man. Perhaps he's appearing there to this way in Moses. And perhaps that's the case. But the point is, is that this is not some other being. We don't have other categories, like there's God, the angels, and this mysterious angel, the Lord. No, this is God. In some way, perhaps in the form of Christ, God wanted Moses to have an encounter with himself. Moses is not having an encounter with an angel. Moses is in the presence of God. It is God that is speaking to him. And this God that is speaking to him is appearing as a fire. Now, why a fire? Well, I wanna skip and talk more about this in a little bit later, but just know, first of all, this fire has profound symbolism. It was God who led them with the fire by night. It was God who had a fire in the tabernacle. The fire, at this point, symbolizes the very presence of God. That's the significance. So again, all this to say, what Moses knows right away from this burning bush is that he is in the presence of God. God. Fire is not consuming the bush because the fire doesn't need fuel to sustain itself. It doesn't need to burn up the bush. It's self-sustained. This is the presence of God appearing to him. Now look at what happens next. Verse 4. When the angel saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. The idea was for emphasis. Listen, he's trying to get his attention. He uses his name twice. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Let me stop here and think about this for a minute. So he knows he's in the presence of God, and he calls Moses, Moses, I want you to listen. He says, here I am. In other words, I'm ready. I'm your servant. And the first thing he tells him to do is, is to take off your sandals. Now, why is that? Why does he have to remove his shoes? Why is that significant? Well, the answer is, is because he was dirty. I don't don't think it's any more complicated than that. Every day for a living, he walked behind sheep. His feet were, had all kinds of mud and dirt and debris and feces and everything else on them. He He was dirty, he was a shepherd. And so God here is giving us a hint of what he'll do later when the priests have the tabernacle and he calls them to purify themselves with all these ritualistic rites. The idea is, is that you don't just kind of stroll into God's presence. This is serious. It's sober. You're in the very presence of God. It reminds us of Isaiah chapter 6 when God reveals himself to Isaiah. He's brought, if you will, into the throne room of God and he thinks he's gonna die. I'm undone. I'm gonna be dead. I've seen the very presence of God. I don't think I can live anymore. 
So the point is, is that God is profoundly holy. This is the point. And Moses is just a guy, if you will. In fact, this little story uh, teaches us a lot about the holiness of God. In fact, listen to this. If you want to turn to it, you can. But this is Exodus chapter 24, speaking of the fire. Because I think this same idea about him being in the holiness of God relates a lot to the fire. So, verse 17, this is Exodus 24, 17. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people. So the idea is when they saw the glory of the Lord, they anticipated around that glory there would be fire, a consuming fire. And the book of Hebrews borrows this language. Remember this from Hebrews 13, 8, or excuse me, 13, um, Verse, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So, God is holy, He's different, He's unique, and He's represented in a fire. Now, that shouldn't suggest to us that God, however, is unapproachable. Because here we have an example of God approaching Moses and here we have this tension that we embrace in worship that we all come into this place. We all come in with different circumstances and situation and guilt over sins and different needs that we have. We feel welcome in this place. We're welcome in this environment. And so we know that anybody can come in and yet when we're together worshiping God, we know that we're worshiping a God that is completely holy. There's something real about this, something sobering about this. And so I'm, I'm cautious when we see songs that say, God, show me your holiness or show me your glory or we want to see the glory of God move. I understand and I'm not trying to be one of those guys that's always nitpicking about songs, but, but this is the point. No one asked to see God's glory in the Old Testament. Why? Well, because they had seen a little bit of it on the mountain and they were scared senseless. The only person that asked for it is Moses in Exodus chapter 33 and God says, no. I can't, I'll kill you. I can't show you my glory. You die in a moment. Jesus, perhaps, in Matthew, reveals a little bit of his glory. Remember when the guards fell down, the census, he revealed a little bit of who he was? And this is why when God really met with them, if you read the end of verse 6, it says, and Moses hid his face for he's afraid to look at God. So here we have this tension where we come to God and we're welcome to his presence, but the presence of God is sober, it's real, and it's awesome. There's this profound seriousness about this moment. God was a consuming fire. Which, which makes this whole story really kind of interesting. Because God is interacting with Moses. Now who is Moses? Well, I mean, we see him as this great leader, but at this point in the story, Moses is no one. I mean, I mean literally he's no one. You say, but yes, he was privileged because he came out of Pharaoh's house. Well, yes, but the only reason he was there is because God led him. Remember, God used the Nile to float him right into the place where he needed to be. It was God who put him there. It was God who gave him the education at Pharaoh's house. It was God who provided all these things for him. In fact, Moses' name, you know, is, is drawn out. You might give your kid a name because his name means royal one or chosen one or brave or strong. And Moses' name means drawn out. His very name did not mean what he was. It meant what others had done for him. And every time someone cried out Moses, it was a reminder that he was nothing unless God had exited him, had drawn him out of the water. He was no one. And when God found him, he was a dirty shepherd. And there's something so hopeful there and powerful there. And that is God that is wholly other, a God that is absolutely self-contained, a God that needs nothing to be complete in and of himself is the same God that approaches us and draws us into himself. And this chapter paints the picture of someone who is an absolutely on the lowest ladder on the social rung and he is the one who God chooses to demonstrate God's power, not Moses' power. If God would do that for Moses, he could do it for us, he could draw us in and use us. Something incredibly hopeful there about that. So God teaches Moses in this great moment of clarity something about himself, that he's holy, something about Moses, that he's dirty. But God also teaches him something else. Look at verse six. This is very interesting. And he said, this is God's self-reference. This is God's self-identification. And he said, I am the God, watch this, of your father, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, God could have introduced himself to Moses in any number of ways. Why does he tie in his, his introduction with who he has in the past? This Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these patriarchs of the faith. What's the point of that? Well, there's actually something very practical here, and it's found in Mark chapter 12. And so we're going to come right back to Exodus chapter 3, but look at Mark chapter 12. We say, Pastor, okay, we're in Exodus 3. Why aren't we turning all the way over to the New Testament to Mark chapter 12? And why is it that you just don't have the the verses on there so I wouldn't have to bring my Bible? That's the point. So you, so you have to bring your Bible. Um, it's this, studying the Bible is tactile. You're holding it. You're touching it. Uh, maybe you're flipping to it on your phone or whatever, but it doesn't matter. So we're doing it here together. Preaching is more than Bible study, but it's no less. So we're studying this together. We're looking at the scriptures. So look at Mark chapter 12. Here's why we read this. Because in Mark chapter 12, Jesus references Exodus chapter 3. Now listen, this is kind of, kind of an aside, but this is very, very important. How do we understand the Old Testament? The principal way you would understand the Old Testament is through the New Testament. That's generally true, but sometimes a New Testament passage will comment on an Old Testament passage. So the best person to help us understand God is God, right? The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And so here is what Jesus said about this passage. Now just to set up the context of uh, Mark chapter 12, there was a a group of people called the Sadducees and they did not believe in the resurrection. Um, There was no resurrection from the dead. And so gave this scenario to Jesus. The scenario was here, trying to trick Jesus. Look, here's the scenario, Jesus. uh, A couple gets married, the husband dies, the wife remarries, that husband dies, the wife remarries, that husband dies, and this happens seven times. Now why the seventh guy didn't, you know, Get a clue? I don't know. But he didn't. He marries her anyway, thinking this is going to be wonderful. But he dies, and they're trying to trap Jesus. And so they get to heaven, and they ask Jesus, okay, look, they get to heaven. Okay, so now who is she really married to? Answer that one, Jesus. So here's his response, uh, Mark 12, 24. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. That's interesting. They were experts in the scripture, and he's saying, you really don't know the scripture. And he's speaking of, by the way, what we just read, Exodus 12, Exodus 3. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven, and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You're quite wrong. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, look, God out of the burning bush didn't say to Moses, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. No. He's bringing those people up to remind him that he made the covenant promise to them because he made the covenant promise to Abraham. He's renewing it, but there's something else. And that is that he's telling Moses, hey, why don't you know something? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're still alive. (laughs) And the reason why we know that's what he wanted to communicate to him is because Jesus told us in Mark chapter 12, God's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. If they were dead, he would have used the past tense, he uses the present tense. And I think those two are related. The reason why you know, Moses, that I'm gonna keep my covenant relationship to Abraham, the reason why you know that is because, by the way, they're right over there. They're in heaven with me. (laughs) And so I could just step away from the text and say something just really practical. Um, As a pastor, one of the things I do is I go to a lot of funerals. Sometimes I'm presiding in the funerals. Sometimes I'm just attending in the funerals. And sometimes at a funeral or there's a graveside and we never... Uh, you know, criticize someone for this. They'll say sentimental things, you know, that we wonder if they're true. Like, you know, mama's looking at me right now or I sensed her spirit the other day, you know, and we don't know if that's really biblical, if that's really sentimental, right? So we we wonder with all these type of things. Let me just stop and say, if you've lost a loved one, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, a granddad, and God forbid you've buried a child. Here's what this passage is teaching us. They're alive. (laughs) They're alive. Why do you know that? Because God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. 
And the reason why he was so insistent that he would keep his promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Javit and fulfill it through Moses is because they were right there. So I think there's a very real sense, a biblical sense, I'm not making this, this is not sentiment, a real biblical sense in which their faith was, was living on through Moses. In the same way that the faith of those that have gone on before you is living on through you, there's this connection there. They're alive, they're in the presence of God. What a remarkable, comforting, and thrilling thought. So, Moses has this incredible moment of clarity. He, um, he knows who God is. He's holy. And he's not only holy, but he's the holy covenant-keeping God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that are still alive. And he learns a little bit about who he himself is, that he's dirty and doesn't deserve to be in the presence of God. But now, in the next verse, the whole tone of the passage shifts. Now God becomes, if you will, programmatic. He lays out the plan. This is what I'm gonna do. And so now it's no longer a dialogue, it's a monologue. God is explaining to him what's gonna go on. Look at verse seven. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. What God is doing there in verse seven and on into verse eight is he's saying, hey, Moses, I want you to see it from my perspective. I know what's going on. He's giving them the heavenly view of things, verse eight, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land. So Moses, you might be wondering why God is manifesting himself. His presence is residing inside of a bush. What brings me to this moment at this time is the prayers of God's people. I've heard them. I've seen their affliction, that word affliction implies both emotional and physical abuse. I've seen how my people are abused, I've had enough, and I've, I've come down to intervene. And again, here's the program, the plan, here's what I'm gonna do. Verse eight again, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good land and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, why are those countries listed? Well, to affirm the idea that it's a broad land. It's a big piece of property. Look at all the tribes that are in occupying it. It's a big land. And not only that, he wants them to know it's a great abundant land. It's got milk and honey in it. It flows with milk and honey. Now, um, that metaphor, growing up you know, in church and always hearing the phrase, it was a land of milk and honey, that never resonated with me. That, that feels sticky. And as an adult, it feels like loaded with carbs. I mean, how much carbs in milk and honey and fat and whole milk? I mean, that seems, that's nothing attractive about that. Cows and bees, right? Imagine a state tourism society saying we have tons of cows and bees move here. This is where you wanna live. So what's going on with this? Well, it doesn't make sense to us, but it made perfect sense to them because they only ate, generally speaking, what they had recently made. This is why Egypt is saved with Joseph. Remember back in Genesis where he creates the whole idea of storehouses. That was a novel idea because you made your food that day and you ate it. If there's a bad crop, you didn't eat well. Food was not taken for granted. It wasn't a right. We feel like food is our right. We have too much of it. We throw a ton of it away, but not for them. It was a privilege. And so they were just scraping by. And God says to them, you're gonna move from scraping by to having abundance. You're gonna go to a land where the soil produces this rich grain. And in fact, the honey that's there may not even be bee honey. They didn't have a lot of bees. They had some back then. It was mainly what was extracted from the dates and the figs. It's gonna be so productive in that land that you're gonna have excess. You're not just gonna have the grapes and the figs and the dates. You're gonna have what they themselves produce. It's an incredibly fruitful place. That's where I'm moving you into. And it's a big place, as we said, again, based upon all the tribes that that live there, look at verse nine. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So Moses is drawn into God's presence. From that presence, he's in clarity. Moses, here's who you are and here's who I am. And from that moment though, everything shifts in verse 10. Here's who I am, here's what I want to do, here's the reason why I've come down. Now look at verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, 
out of Egypt. This is absolutely fascinating. Again, who was Moses? Nobody. What leadership skills did he have? Well, he's going to demonstrate great leadership, but nothing to this point. No resume. God just says, by the way, I have come down. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. Now, Moses, come a little closer. I want to show you how you're a part of this. In fact, when it says come there in verse 10, that's actually a command, an imperative. One commentator said it like this. God's call to Moses is not in the form of a question, as if he had a choice in the matter, would you like to do this? It is in the form of a command, a Hebrew imperative. So now go. So by divine fiat, Moses, the shepherd, has been chosen to shepherd Israel out of the land of darkness and into the wilderness and onto the promised land. He didn't enroll. He was drafted. He was appointed for this. I'm going to do an incredible thing, Moses, and I'm going to use you to do it. And throughout the rest of the book of Exodus, it talks about God as a deliverer and Moses as a deliverer, and those two are interchangeable. It's the, the author's way of showing us that God was the deliverer, but he used Moses to do it. It was Moses as the instrument in God's hands who's going to do it. And throughout the book of Exodus, it's very interesting. The people gave Moses a really hard time I mean, a really hard time. They leave it to Beaver and say they gave him the business. They gave him the business all the time. But you know what's interesting about this? He's always the leader. <laughs> He's always the leader. I mean, even though it was hard, even though they questioned him, even though there was mutiny at times, still, he was always the leader. Why? Well, because of this experience. God just established that it would be so. Now, watch this pattern. Let's back away from the text. I want you to watch this pattern. Into the presence of God, Clarity about who he is and who God is. And then commissioning. His life's purpose, his reason for existence is right here, but it comes after being in the presence of God, clarity about who he is, and then finally is that commission, the reason for which God called him and appointed him. And you see this pattern really all throughout scripture. It's the same as Abraham. Abraham was called just as a shepherd. Abraham, come, here's who you are, here's who I am, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and sojourn out into this land, to a land that I'm going to show you, Genesis chapter 12. But even into the New Testament, this is the same pattern. That Jesus calls disciples to himself, they stay in his presence. He trains them, gives them clarity about who he is, what his plan is, what the kingdom is, what he's going to lead them to do. And then he commissions them to go out. And then after Jesus ascends back into heaven, a new age starts, the church age. But it's the same pattern. Come into my presence, Acts 1, wait till the Holy Spirit comes. I'm going to clarify who you are and who I am, and then I'm going to commission you and send you out. And then later in Acts chapter 13, as we've said before, when the first missionary movement takes place, it was out of a prayer meeting, seeking the presence of God, God giving clarity about who they are, and then out of that clarity comes the commission, the going. And so one of the reasons we're so passionate about prayer as a church is, is this reason. Because we feel like prayer is not just getting what we want. Prayer is not just asking and receiving. Prayer is aligning our hearts with God's commissioning. So as I said a minute ago, we're starting a Wednesday night training time, if you will. We're all going to gather in here at 6 o'clock. And I just want to challenge you to make this the rhythm of your week as a family. That you're going to come here, you're going to be fed. Kids are going to this amazing programming. Then you come here for be trained. But a big part of that will be prayer. We're going to spend about a half hour or so in the training and then more time in, in prayer. Maybe 15 or 20 minutes in prayer and you'll be led back to go with your your groups, why are we doing that? Because we don't have any clarity in the future about who God is and much less any commission about where we're to go all, unless we have God's presence. All that flows out of God's presence. And I've just watched God do miraculous things in my life and our family's life and specifically in the life of our church without anybody saying, hey, look, here's an idea. It's just seeking the presence of God. And from his presence comes clarity about who we are, clarity about who God is, and from his presence comes commissioning. And so really anything that we've seen in terms of mission and programming and vision and direction, identity, all that comes just from seeking the Lord. That's where it comes from. We're trying to sense what direction God has for us and we're trying to do that from the posture of being on our knees because we have nothing greater in this life but the presence of the Lord. And so I want to make a couple of applications to try to wrap all this up. But before I do, let me just confess to you that as we make applications in this passage, 
Um, I, I do so kind of with a little bit of fear and trepidation. You say, why would you say that? Well, because um, this passage, first of all, the reason why I'm a little fearful to make applications is one of a kind, right? I'm not leaving here saying, hey, go have your burning bush moment. There was only one burning bush, right? And it's, and it's happened. And unless your name is Moses, uh, it didn't happen to you. This is unique. It's singular in the massive plan of God. It won't be replicated in that way. It's unique. And the other reason I have a little bit of hesitation, just being totally honest with you, when we talk about the sequence, this pattern of providence where people are in God's presence, they get clarity about who they are, and then finally they're commissioned, that sequence that seems so clear and seems so obvious, the truth of the matter is, is that what's different about you and I and Moses is that Moses had no further revelation, right? Moses couldn't check what God was saying against his Bible. He was living the Bible, right? He had no Bible. And so we're in a very different situation. We live after the time of Christ, which is God's word to us, John 1. Everything God wants us to know about himself has been revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did not verbally say, John 14 through 16 tells us that he wants us to know about himself. He led people to write down. We have this closed canon of Bible. And so if you're thinking about obeying God, moving in what God has called you to do, you don't have to pray about obedience. You don't have to get the idea, God, I would go on a great missionary trip, but I'm waiting in this service for you to somehow speak to me. God's already spoken. It's laying in your lap right now. It's the Great Commission. And go make disciples. Do it overseas, do it in your neighborhood, do it in your home. If you're waiting for God to speak to you, he has already spoken. It's done. It's complete right here. Go do it. So we're not waiting to obey. <laughs> We're not waiting to obey. So with those caveats in place though, let me make two applications this morning. And the first one is simply this, that, that we are a people that are seeking God's presence. Remember this, that when we seek God's presence, we learn what it's like not just to be a good Christian, we learn what it's like to be human. Because God created humans in his presence. Physiologically, psychologically, in every conceivable way, we were made. The reason why God made us is to enjoy him, enjoy his presence. So we're made to be in God's presence. And so as we seek the presence of God in our lives, we understand what it's like to be fully human, to be fully alive is what it means. So what does it mean to be a people of God's presence? Well, it's just simple. If I could be practical for a minute, we wake up in the morning and we decide... Uh, not to think about other things, we decide to worship God. Could be through song, it could be calling out the names of God, it could be whispering a prayer, but we decide from that moment on, I'm, I'm gonna worship God. And from that place of worship then, we, we go sometime during the day, preferably that morning to start the day off right, and we spend some time in God's word. We're learning, but this is not just about information. This is about being in the presence of God. By prayer, we're talking to him. By God's word, he's talking to us. It's communication. It's communal. It's a relationship. We're together. We're communicating. Um, all of that is, is taking place in a time that we've dedicated to seek God's presence. Sometimes when I seek God's presence, and maybe you've had this experience, it's so real, it's palpable. Uh, that you just sense God is there. But there are other times it's not. You say, well, why do you keep reading your Bible and praying if you don't sense God's presence? Because we live by faith. Most of life is made up of ordinary days, right? Most of life is not about how do you manage the worst tragedy in the world, although those happen, or how do you manage the, the mountain peak, although those happens. Most of the time, life is managing the mundane. And it's into that monotony that we're seeking the presence of God because in that presence, we're getting clarity about everything else. How does God want me to raise my family? How does God want me to spend my money? Now look, those things aren't as mysterious as we think. It's spelled out in God's word. He's already communicated with us. So read it, enjoy his presence, and respond. I mean, don't we all want to have clarity about what he's created us to be and what direction we should go in life and what is the meaning of all this? I fear that sometimes we traded just another form of worldliness, if you will, 
We just have a Christian version of it because we come here on Sundays, but we don't seek the presence of God any more than someone who doesn't come to church on Sundays. So what's the point of that? When we come together and worship, what happens as a result is that we now experience corporately what we've been experiencing every day in our lives. We've been meditating on the Word of God, thinking about the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, uh, and, and praying and seeking God, worshiping God, and we come together. It's a collective vision of who we are individually, and that's why it makes worship exciting and dynamic because it's an expression of, of who we are. So seek God. Seek to know God, not just for His presence or His power or for His blessing or favor but just seek him just to be with him just enjoy him and to be in his presence so that would be the first application is simply to seek God but the second application is this and that is that as we're seeking the presence of God as he's giving us clarity understand what we see in the life of Moses is that that clarity came with a cost clarity has a cost you say what do you mean by that well back in Exodus chapter 2 remember what Moses did He committed murder, and so he he hid the body, and he fled. And we observed last week that, oddly, God does not condemn him for that in the passage. Of course, murder is condemned in Scripture. It's not condoned, but the focus was on the fact that he left. He didn't try to go hide and become this minor aristocrat inside the land of Egypt, but he he actually left. He got out of there. And what we're supposed to take away from that is given to us in Hebrews chapter 11. You can turn there if you like, but let me read it again because, again, this is God's commentary on God. This is what we're supposed to think about Exodus chapter 2. Here's God's commentary on on that moment. By faith, this is Hebrews 11, 23, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt. It's just a phenomenal thought that what is driving Moses is not that he knew that there was this grand plan awaiting for him. He didn't know that when he left Egypt. He just knew that whatever life was, it wasn't that. And he was getting away from that. He'd never be that. No matter if God blessed him or the sense of it is, although we know the sense of it is, he just thought that for the rest of his life, he was going to be a a Bedouin shepherd on the backside of the desert. But that's okay because he had made a really costly decision. I'm not going to align myself with those people who are or haters of God. I'm going to align myself with the faith of my mother, not the faith, in this case, of my adopted family, if you will. So I love this because Moses had profound clarity about who he was not. So every one of us as a believer will have people in our life, sometimes well-meaning, who will try to define you by your past. You are one of us. You're this, you're that. Sure, you're going to go to church, but the truth of the matter is, this is what people say about you. All that's just for show, for pretense, because we know back home, we know from your past who you really are. And they try to define you. Not only will other people try to define you, but yourself will try to define yourself in odd ways. Some good and some bad. Who are you? If you ask a man who you are, or many people, but especially men, are prone to this. I am this. That blank is filled in by the occupation. I'm this. This is who I am. Or it's filled in by an accomplishment. I'm this type of person who has done this. But what this passage is calling us, this connection between Hebrews 11 and Exodus chapter 3, is to show us that our accomplishments in this life ultimately do not define us. Now, someone said it to me this way, and I think it's helpful, that your occupation is not your vocation, it's your avocation. My vocation is not pastoring a church, that's my avocation. My vocation, what I'm after, is to live for God, advance his kingdom, and bring other people into it. Who are you? Well, I'm an engineer. No, you're not an engineer, that's your avocation. Your vocation is to advance the kingdom. Not to leave engineering, to be an engineer, but in that moment... 
to live for the kingdom of God. Well, I'm a student. That's who I am. You're not a student. That's what you do uh, throughout the day. Who you're really called to be is as a student, advance the kingdom. Not leave that, but in that, do what God has called you to do. And one of the reasons Moses was so used of God, it seems like in the staging, is because he had tremendous clarity about what he was not. Moses knew that he had to be like a seed that goes into the ground and dies. That he had to be like Matthew 13, says, a man who finds a treasure in his field and in great joy he sells all that he has just to get that. Or like what the prophet said about the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 50, that he set his face like a flint, like a stone. His face was set to do what God has called him to do. And then later barring that, Luke says in Luke 9, 51, that Jesus set his face for Jerusalem. He was very clear about what God had called him to do, very clear about what he wasn't, and very clear about what was next for him. So it's this incredible conviction that came with this great cost of not letting anyone else define you, not letting the world define you, this conviction that set him on this profound trajectory. And that conviction, as we said, comes with a, a price, it comes, with a, it comes with a tremendous cost. And I just bring that up because I think perhaps I glossed that last Sunday, and I want to just go back and be really clear as we're talking about the presence of the Lord, that when you look at all of these events in Exodus 2 and 3, What's driving these people is faith. In fact, this again is where Hebrews 11 is helpful because you may think that what happened with Moses' mother is that she was just scared. She didn't know what to do, you know, and so she just kind of threw the baby in a basket and just put him away right quick, fearful of the king. But we know from Hebrews 11 that's not the case. By faith, Moses, verse 23, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the faith was beautiful. The child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So the emotion that's driving them is not fear, but rather it's, it's belief in God. That fits better the trajectory of the story. I mean, think about this. The midwives feared God more than they feared the king, what everybody else expected them to do, and so they hid the truth from the king. Jochebed feared God, and so in defiance to the king, she hid Moses. Moses feared God more than he wanted the pleasures of Egypt, and so he hid uh, his deed and he fled into the wilderness to hide. So that clarity about your life comes at the cost of leaving behind the world's expectations of you and says, whatever I'm going to be in the future, I'm not going to be that. I'm moving on. Hey, one, one other thought that I think is really interesting that I was thinking about this week, and that is, have you ever wondered what did Moses actually give up? There was a Disney movie a while back called Prince of Egypt. Do you remember that? that? The premise was is that he gave up being the Prince of Egypt. But we know if you scratch it a little bit below the stores, historical surface that that's not actually true. Uh, this is probably Ramses II as the Pharaoh who there was. If that's the case, he had 60 daughters. Can you imagine that? 60 daughters as well as sons. And so... Moses probably, as best we can tell, most likely would have been a minor aristocrat. He would not have great prominence. He certainly would have followed the Pharaoh because he, he wasn't Egyptian by birth. Um, he would have just kind of been comforted in King's Palace. Uh, he would have gotten Super Bowl tickets. He wouldn't have been in the box, but he'd gotten Super Bowl tickets at Wimbledon. He wouldn't be in the royal box, but he'd get good seats uh, because he would be an outlier to royalty, right? Not, not royalty, but an outlier. He would have been around those type of things. So whatever he was giving up, it wasn't so much about the prestige as much as it was about the comfort. But when I read that, I thought, you know, it's really interesting. Because I've noticed even in myself a desire to treasure comfort or what we would think minor things and the things of this world, things of this life, for the presence of God. Instead of saying, God, there is absolutely nothing in this life that is more valuable than you. I'll define myself by how you define me and I'll welcome the fact that you are welcoming me and drawing me in to your presence. Father God, we are grateful for your love for us. God, we thank you that your holiness demands that we remove our shoes, that we come in pure. And Father God, uh, your love demands that you would draw us in. And God, we praise you for that. 
In just a minute, we're going to sing, and when we sing, we'll have an invitation is what we call it here because God is inviting us to respond. But let me share something with you, just really bluntly. Some of you have come to know Christ, you're believers in Christ, and this moment is not about finding Jesus for you. You found Jesus. This moment for you is about responding to Jesus. He's drawing you into his presence. And maybe you've looked at kind of what the world aspires you to be and what you aspire to be inside the world and thought, this is it. Of course, I'll attend to the things of God over here, but really, this is it for me. And this is flipping that whole model. We're saying, God, your presence is everything. I have a vocation and an avocation in this world, but your presence is everything to me. I'm not going to define myself by the ways of the world anymore. If that's the case, respond to God. How is he responding to you? If you've never come to Christ, please understand that in this story there's some gospel there too because all of us must come to God pure. No one is going to come to God who has sin and be accepted into heaven, which is a problem because all of us are sinners. All of us have the dirty feet of Moses. And so God, knowing that and knowing we don't have the ability to clean ourselves, provides Christ whose life cleans ours, whose goodness is credited toward ours, and by his suffering we have access to God. He provides that for us, but we must respond to him in grace. And for some of you, this morning is about saying, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want to turn from sin. I want to turn to him, bow the knee to God, and call upon him, and ask that his mercy would meet me there. And if so, just do that right now. If you don't want to pray, just pray, God, forgive me of my sin. You can even just pray right now in your heart, God, forgive me my sin. Come into my life. I want to live for you. Give your life to him. Receive what Christ has done for you and enjoy the presence of God. For whatever reason you want to respond to him, you just come. Our pastors are going to be here at the front. They're ready to receive you. If you want to make a decision to follow Christ, a decision to join the church, we'd love to have a conversation with you about that as well. Whatever it is, you just come. Father God, we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would be with us, be on us. And Father, that we respond in abandonment and obedience right now. And we pray because of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If God's need to come, our pastors are here. You just step out for any reason when to come, you come.